Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 109. And guess what? We're in person! For the first time in uh, like a year or so, we're in person and recording this next episode, which is on making S3 objects. Yeah, making S3 objects. Um, I'm not going to lie, this episode might not make a whole heck of a lot of sense initially, <laughs> but if you stick with it, there's some cool things that you can do with this, which... We're going to break this into two episodes, maybe more than two episodes. But um, so this n initial entry, you're going to look at these things and go, huh? This is a lot. What, what, what am I going to use this for? But the next episode after this, we're going to show you how to use it for something more practical. Exactly. It'll come back, come back to you, and uh, it'll, it'll hopefully make sense here. So I will make us a little bit smaller so you can see us. All right. So episode 109, Making an S3 Object. So when I started this series, I talked about how there are multiple different object systems that exist in the R ecosystem. Base, which is the objects that we've talked about already. So lists, integers, numerics, um, dates are kind of included in that. Eh. Uh, but then there's S3, S4, R6, RC, R7. I've heard R9 kind of floated around. Um, we're gonna talk about S3. And a large, the reason we're gonna be doing that is because I know it very well. I use it a lot uh, when I develop packages. Um, and then a large percentage of our packages in the general R ecosystem also use S3 objects. So understanding how they work and how you can interact with them is a really powerful tool. So you can kind of look at the guts of them and know what's going on. Uh, Hadley, of course, wrote in his advanced R book uh, some thoughts around the object-oriented systems that exist in the R world. If you want to learn more about that from somebody that really knows what they're talking about, definitely take a look at that. You can find the link right here, advr.hadley.nz.oo, so object-oriented.html. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you want to take us through the benefits of an S3 object? Yeah, so some of the benefits. Um, they're really easy to initialize. We're going to take a look at initializing one here in a second, and you'll see how easy it is. Um, they piggyback off of the existing infrastructure. You'll see when we run some of these, you're going to go, that's it? That's what the S3 is? It kind of looks like other things that we've seen before, and you've seen them before. Uh, anyway, and they're really flexible and easily expandable, and uh, especially in our, um, uh, in our second edition in this series, you'll see how uh, flexible and ex expandable they can be. So to initialize uh, an S3 object, you simply use this function called structure. And uh, this first one is, is very simple. We, all we're doing is we're saying we're going to initialize this S3 structure, and it's going to be the number 24. So all you have to pass is the argument dot data, and you get returned back. 24. So you're thinking, well, what the heck? It's a vector with 24. What does that mean? Uh, something that you want to add to your S3 object is information about it. So you can define your object, and you can do this by using the class tag, and you can add other information, like we add the, the time of creation here in this example. But you set these attributes, and um, you've probably seen this in different base R functions. If you messed around, sometimes uh, uh, they'll produce an output and then at the bottom they'll have this ATTR, these little attributes that come out that are other bits of information that give you context about what's there. And so we're going to create a, um, uh, we're gonna create a structure here with some attributes. It's just to show you what it might look oh, like yeah, when there you, you go. see it. Mm -hmm. It's this ATTR which stands for attributes um, and then the tag name. So this is additional information for our S3 object. Um, and I just put a number, it could be any object really. Uh, it doesn't really keep you from doing that. And so we are defining the structure of this new S3 object. So the data can accept any type of um, base R structure, right? A base R object. We want, we're choosing a list because it's incredibly flexible. And most of the S3 objects that I generate use lists to store the data because I have a variety of different inputs that I want to be keeping with it and they don't all I don't all want them all to be the same type mm -hmm. and so this allows me to store this information inside of my my new s3 object um, however I want to in the, the order that makes sense to me 
Um, and so here we're going to create a structure um, into the data entry. We're going to have a list. It's got the message. Tidyx is awesome. <laughs> and the authors, I'm going to be passing into that element a vector with our two names in it. We'll set the attribute to this new S3 object with the system time. So this will, when this code gets run, it's going to capture the system time of my computer here. Um, and then we're going to set the class, which is not something that we did above here, but this is the class. So you know when you call the class function on like a data frame and whatnot, it returns data.frame, or uh, if you do it Mr. on matrix, yeah. it returns matrix. This is just telling R, my object is of type custom message in this situation here. You can... Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna overload this information yet. <laughs> uh, there's there's lots of tricks you can do. So we're gonna create this new S3 object, and we're gonna print it and show it. And okay, so cool. that that kind of came out here. So we've got the message tidyx. Uh, the information that we dropped in there is exactly how you'd expect it to look. I mean, if we were just to create a list with this information, it looks exactly how you'd expect. It just has these extra attributes here. Mm -hmm. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, one of the uh, real strengths of working in S3 object is that there's a bunch of different, uh, they're called generics, that exist already in base R that we can kind of piggyback off of and use. And so when other people start to be using our S3 objects that we've created, uh, they don't have to learn a whole new set of functions to get a specific desired behavior. And so the one that I uh, use most commonly because we're very visual uh, people is to um, create my own methods for printing and formatting my object. In this case, we're only gonna show you how to do printing, but um, it works the same exact for formatting, or if you've done any regression at all and used like LM, GLM, those return special objects, an LM model object or a GLM model object. And that allows you to then use predict. And you use, if you notice, you use the same predict function everywhere. But that's because it is also a generic. And it, it figures out it has different methods for your LM object, your GLM object, your random forest object, all yeah. these different objects. But you know that you can get the correct answer and run this with the predict function. Right, so if you ever were to uh... If you had those packages loaded, random forest, um, LME4 for, for mixed models. If you had those packages loaded and you did question mark predict um, and then gave it a dot. It's, yeah, sorry, this is a private function. There. So there you go. So you can see that the predict is the function and then random forest is, is that type. You know, there'll be like predict.lm, there'll be predict.glm, there'll be predict.lmer. Uh, you can see it right there. And obviously he doesn't have LME4 loaded or anything like that. But if you had other packages loaded, you would see that. And so that's how it works. Um, that's how object oriented languages work. Like if anybody who's ever been a Pythonista knows, this is how you pretty much do everything in Python is you, Call the object and then or call your um, um, data and dot object and do <laughs> keep it, it, chaining things together. It goes it goes off into the world. Into, right. into the world. So you can see you can know that a function is a generic or uh, uses methods if you look at the actual function. So you know the print function and we run it and it goes okay. Here's my arguments, but here are my only guts. The innards of my function are only use method print. And that is telling R, look at the class of X, try to find the method that implements print dot whatever the class name is. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you never want to be using dots in the function names of the functions that you write. And so here, this is how you tell R, I've created a special print function for my new object custom message. And so this is print dot object name function X and triple dots. What's important here is to use these triple dot notation. I'm not going to spend a ton of, or I'm not going to really spend any time going into that because we're not using it, but it's important to use triple dots uh, when you write your functions when you're using these methods. Uh, we're going to create a message that we will be returning based on our object so we know the message, we know the authors, we're going to concatenate them together. 
we're going to pull out the attribute of our creation time from our print object so that we can add that into the message. So, and then we're going to cat this out. Sorry, that's a very quick overview, but this is not the point of this uh, screencast uh, today. We're going to run this, and as you can see, now as opposed to that ugly list that was printing out before, it has this nice visualization of our message. So it says start message, contents. The contents of my message is tidyx is awesome, which I agree. Uh, the author is myself and Patrick. He's been complicit in this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the creation time was we were recording on the 29th. So uh, we recorded it at 6.08 p.m. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So that is how you can create a custom print method. A similar idea extends to any other methods that you're going to be, uh, generics that you're going to be extending. But really functionally, you probably don't want to be calling... Um, structure every time you want to be creating your new S3 object. Think you could accidentally mistype uh, the class type, a custom message. You could uh, forget to include a piece of the uh, S3, especially right here. It's a really simple S3 object, but if you get more complicated S3 objects that have a variety of inputs, it could get really tough and annoying to do so, which is why you write a function that will create your S3 object for you. You, uh, I, I, the nomenclature that I've seen a lot is a lot of people put new underscore and then the uh, class name that you're going to be doing. So here it's new message or new custom message. If I wanted to follow the semantics more closely, this function takes in two arguments, the message that I plan on delivering and the by argument. Mm -hmm. uh, I am then going to pass this into the same structure. This is the same exact format that we had for the earlier structure, so it takes the, it makes a list of the name and the authors, captures the system date for when it was created, and it sets a class to be custom message. So we can run that, and now we've got a function that will create the S3 class for us. And so we can do things like, you should like and subscribe to TidyX hmm. from me. Uh, down below, you should click the button right now. Um, and so you can run this and it's going to assign it to M1. So uh, you can't quite see this here. I'll move uh, the S M1 exists now here. You can see it's got all these uh, attributes here in our environment viewer. But we can also print M1 here for message one. And it still uses that same print method that I showed below because it's still loaded into our environment. And so it's going to print nicely. And then uh, this next message, you should consider becoming a patron at Patreon at patreon.com slash tidy explained uh, because we'd really appreciate it if you like the work that we've been doing. And so we can also just run this and this can show this same exact message. There you go. So this is a quick um, introduction. This is not everything you need to know about creating S3 objects and working with, with S3 objects, but I thought it was nice to take the last several weeks that we've been talking about several different base R object types to go now into an S3 object type that exists mm -hmm. that um, you, you might use. And then next time we'll take the information from here and basically the information from the past several episodes because we're going to use a whole bunch of different objects <laughs> in our S3 in practice uh, uh, seg segment that we're going to do next week. Um, and that's really going to yeah, utilize a ton of different object types, including S3 object types, and really kind of tie it all together in a cool applied project that I think anybody who enjoys um, sports and sort of round robin tournaments will enjoy. Exactly. So with that, this was a really quick episode. I'm quick. really, really, really proud of us right now. Mm. Uh, thank you all for joining us for 109 episodes. As always, my name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And Tidy Explained is on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained. Tidy dot, dot explained at gmail.com is where you can email us. You can open up a issue on the GitHub repo. Uh, the YouTube channel is where most people like and subscribe and drop their comments, though. That's probably the easiest way to get to us. And if you enjoy our work and uh, want to support us, just as the S3 message says, you can consider becoming a patron, and we would greatly appreciate any support that way. Thank you all so much, and keep on exploring your world.